Today, I'm gonna show you two amazing games I've had recently. And one of them, we're starting off in the Moskva where I'm gonna carry this game pretty hard. And we're gonna do a good job of playing around our teammates and trying to help our team succeed and win this flank. The second one is a very selfish Sherman damage record. I know yesterday I already posted a Sherman video, the full review of it, and well, today I decided to play one game and I broke my damage record. <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna take a look at that one real quick just after. But I do get very greedy for damage in that one. So I wanted to show you this Moskva game as a bit of a contrast as to how you can get damage while still being a great help and value to your team. It's not always the selfish damage farming way that is required to get big games. So we're starting off with some pretty good damage into the Kremlin. It's really not too difficult to farm out a battleship that's pushing in. Just spam HE into the superstructure. This can be done with a lot of cruisers and uh, destroyers as well. And then if they turn broadside, if you have good armor piercing, it might be even worth switching for. So unfortunately, six overpens on that one, but our earlier salvo was just a little bit better. The massive strength of Moskva really is in its armor. So this ship has excellent guns, much like other tier 10 cruisers, but not really standouts. The shell velocity really is the only thing that is kind of standout about these guns. Otherwise, they're pretty standard tier 10 good cruiser guns. Really, it's this armor allowing me to sit in front of these battleships, tanking shots, dodging, that kind of thing, while still getting my DPM into the fight. This is incredibly useful, as soaking up shots from your teammates can lead to your teammates playing a little more aggressively, maybe taking some shots from destroyers or other cruisers that can't bounce shells as easily. It's very, very useful to have this armor. So the Moskva having this ability combined with its very long range radar means that playing these close to island positions, close to cap positions, I should say, near some islands is very, very good. Of course, you don't want to get caught bow in as we saw in my previous uh, Moskva video, if you guys saw that one. Well, I had the best start I've ever had. I had a witherer in less than two minutes or something like that. It was ridiculous. And then I threw it all away, that huge damage potential game, because I over pushed. So playing a little bit smarter around islands can definitely help keep myself alive while still dealing good damage here. The other thing we're getting is radar pressure onto this cap. As I mentioned, the 12 kilometer radar is very, very useful. So now that the Stalingrad has been nerfed, the Moskva has a very, very long range radar with decent duration still. The Nevsky also gets this longer range, good duration radar, but it's not as tanky. It can't sit as close to the capture zones, although it does have better concealment. But that's what I really enjoy about the Moskva, the consistency of these guns, the feeling that I don't really have to worry about overmatching battleships from long range. They're really probably gonna bounce or do a little bit of overpen damage to our superstructure. This confidence to stay in these crucial, powerful positions is very, very nice and what makes the Moskva special. The damage farming comes naturally to this ship with its HE and armor piercing. So that's what I've done so far. The first five minutes of this game have gone by and have really only farmed damage. But our team has pushed so aggressively. And you notice how healthy our Napoli, Ruprecht, and Vladivostok are. I think part of that is because the Kremlin and Z10 have been shooting me at least some of the time. Not all the time, but some of it has gone into my ship, which is really, really quite useful. And now here we catch a destroyer, or our teammates do. And of course, what are we gonna do? We're gonna pop our defensive fire first. <laughs> We're gonna fat finger and get our radar eventually. And this is just absolutely devastating. With the legendary mod on the Moskva, the dispersion is really, really nice. So we hit four shells even into a fully angled destroyer at 10 kilometers. Yeah, the HE hurts a lot, even if it doesn't have the best DPM like Des Moines the amount of shells that you hit is just unbelievable as we absolutely crush this Harigmo. And again, playing close to islands, I will note that this was a dangerous crossing. Uh, there was a Georgia <laughs> who's pushing into the B cap. He's been taken out now, but I could have given up a lot of health to that broadside Georgia in the B cap. 
I thought it was worth the risk though to get all my guns off and hopefully kill this Harukumo in this one. And now we've reached a position that I'm probably going to stay in. You'll notice our Ruprecht is dying very, very quickly. And our Vladivostok is about to follow him. And our Napoli is actually already dead. So pushing out of this gap, even now that we have this cap, really is a bad idea. Pushing into this kind of crossfire is not good. So we're gonna be losing some ships, but as we lose these ships, I really need to take advantage of the spotting and distraction that they're giving to try and take out some of the ships left on this flank. The only way I really see the ability to push through sea like this is if you've pushed all of the enemy ships out of the eight, nine, 10 lines. If they're retreating over to B, down south of A even towards their team, I think pushing through is totally doable. But as it stands, if there's battleships on the 910 lines, especially destroyers as well, a push is never really gonna work here. And that's why I am stopped so, well, passively here relative to what my teammates are doing. But this is a really, really strong position still, assuming I have spotting since the ability to farm over this island is really quite good still. It's been raised up a little bit since the days where this was just a sandbar, but even with Mosfa arcs, I'm still able to get my shells over. And I'm just focusing whatever battleship is pushing at the moment. I could be focusing out the Z10 on the uh, 10 line there, but he's not as much of a threat. So I really want to start focusing more in on the more dangerous battleship. And I make a bit of a misplay here in not switching to the Yugumo quick enough. This ship has such good arcs that really, if a destroyer is within your range, you could probably be shooting at it. Even at 20 kilometers, the shell velocity is so good that it's really only a 10 second lead time, which for a Des Moines, that's in the 12 kilometer range, somewhere in there. Uh, yeah, the shell velocity makes it very easy to hit targets and you're gonna do just that. Even though we only hit three there because of dispersion, well, we can see how easy it is to aim for a destroyer like this Yugumo here, who's quite small relative to other destroyers in the game. We're still doing a pretty good job of hitting him. Now back to the Kremlin, of course. As he gets closer with this good dispersion, I can actually start to target his bow. A problem with Kremlin, of course, is the insane level of armor that it has and relatively small superstructure, especially bow in. It's very, very thin. So. As a Kremlin gets closer, it's a little easier to target the extremities, the bow and stern that are only 32 millimeters, that uh, this Moskva HE can definitely full pen. That's what I'm aiming for when I'm trying to take out a Kremlin at close range. But of course, we're a little bit lucky to have a submarine that can walk up and kill the Kremlin for free right next to him. <laughs> uh, these submarines in the game, man. I really don't like the way they are implemented, and I really hope we're giving due well, some massive reworks to them. I think that uh, the lack of engagement and the lack of ability of surface ships to really see or do anything to them makes the game a little bit more boring and passive and less interesting. I like the destroyer cruiser battleship balance because there's clear advantages given to uh, each class against another one, but it's not such an unfair fight that it's well, literally impossible to win. And uh, that's really my big issue with carriers and submarines as well. It, there's really not a way to win those engagements as, uh, as the surface ship player, unless the enemy messes up. At least in surface ship to surface ship combat, there's an element of the other ship that has the advantage required to mess up, but there are active things you can do as a ship at a disadvantage to tip that engagement in your favor. So it's not all about uh, one player playing well or messing up that determines the uh, result of the engagement. It's both players. And that's what I think is really uh, interesting and good in a multiplayer experience. <laughs> but uh, I'm not gonna get, let myself get sucked into another rant on CVs and subs. You guys have heard that enough. Uh, let's talk about how to deal with a Salem as a Moskva. Especially close range, this can be very, very dangerous as uh, Salem has half the reload basically that this ship has. So we're at a severe DPM disadvantage. And of course he has the uh, amazing armor piercing shells that uh, full pen at uh, just ridiculous angles. The uh, 
Well, Moskva has to be almost bow into a Salem at close range to avoid citadels. So it's a little dangerous. So we're not really able to get all of our guns away. So we're cutting our DPM off by a third. And here we see the other major problem with fighting a Salem or Des Moines at close range as another cruiser. The AP spam into the turrets, it's uh, it's a pretty toxic way, uh, way to engage. Um, I mean, I do it myself in the same. I'm not calling this player toxic. I'm just, I'm just saying permanent gun destruction is very, very frustrating and not a fun game mechanic. Uh, but it's very a good, viable tactic. And uh, well, the Salem swaps to the HE, so we don't have to worry about it too much. But uh, if he just focused my turrets with armor piercing, he'd probably knock them out in no time. Certainly before I can kill him with his super heal. So I'm really reliant here on my submarine to make this Salem mess up in this engagement. If he just goes bow in to me and spams AP into my turrets, there's really not much I could do. He could probably even out DPM in an HE versus HE fight, thanks to that super heal. As we, <laughs> yeah, again, another turret gets knocked out. So that's really unfortunate about the uh, engagement, but it's a really good strategy. So if you are a Salem or Des Moines player going into a bow in engagement against another tier 10 cruiser, Oftentimes, you can just target the turrets, knock them out temporarily or permanently, while still getting good damage into the superstructure if the shells happen to miss. Uh, it's a very easy way to win engagements at close range. And once people have lost both one or both of their turrets in the front, uh, people tend to make misplays, trying to get their rear turret involved, and then of course the full pen angles of the uh, Salem and Des Moines the uh, improved pen angles, I should say, really can Citadel basically all the cruisers to death. Uh, it's a really good tactic. Fortunately, though, for me, I get very lucky that, uh, well, my submarine forced him to beach broadside. So we just pull out here and quickly finish him off. Now, really, all that's left is to take out the enemy submarine as well as the enemy destroyer. We know where the sub is because he just got spotted and was pinging torping our sub. And we get a decent drop in on them, but now we're spotted. And at point blank range, uh, I still have to radar him to really spot him. And yeah, the torps do a ton of damage. Fortunately though, I did click my heal and Kuznetsov certainly helps us live as well with the extra bit of healing. And we get one more airstrike into him and that should be enough to take him out with an extra bit of flooding. What I should have done is healed sooner. That would have been a better play to regain that health to guarantee myself the ability to survive his torpedo salvo. As it stands, I got pretty lucky, but also, uh, well, we managed to have enough HP, basically. I could have played it better to conserve my HP a little bit more and guaranteed living through that salvo. And then, of course, well, the great dispersion strikes again on this Yukimo, and we pick up a Kraken in this one. A really, really good result. 220k damage, Confederate, high caliber, Kraken, Dreadnought. This is an excellent, excellent Mosfa game. Tanking, playing around our teammates, radaring destroyers, focusing targets of priority. This is what Mosfa does at its best, and uh, well, this was a great example of that. On to the next one, the Forest Sherman. And uh, we're gonna do a ton of damage in this one. And I'm gonna play very greedy for damage. This is Epicenter on, uh, what is it? Northern Waters is this one called? Really my uh, least favorite map and game mode combination. I really don't like Epicenter these days since they changed the way the circles work. And uh, well, this map, really, really makes it difficult to play that center cap because there's just really no cover. There's no island support or anything. So uh, we're going to start off by farming a good 20k off of this Yoshino. Taking a pretty good hit in return. I, uh, well, wasn't used to dodging with the <laughs> Sherman. I haven't played it for a little bit, and this was my first game of the day. So I really could have done a better job of managing my health in this one. That's what you're going to notice at the end of this game is that I end up on very, very low HP. So even though it is a really, really strong gunboat, like I mentioned in my review, managing HP is really the crucial part because we don't have that armor. We don't have a heal. We don't have improved saturation like the French DDs do. So really managing the HP pool of the ship is the challenging part as well as positioning because of the poor speed. I'm really just playing selfishly here. I'm relying on my teammates to, uh, well, 
win or contest the middle of the cap, and I'm really not playing the objective at all. I really do think that uh, if I had played the objective, things might have been a little bit easier in the late game. So don't necessarily take this as the way to play to win games. Uh, this one is uh, a very greedy, greedy game. And if you want big damage numbers though, this is a w the way to play. Kiting at the flank, trying to find the big, slow battleships that are very easy to farm. You'll notice going for the fire right away and then swapping to the sap. It's a very good tactic for farming damage out of this ship. And um, it's a very, very selfish playstyle. But it can work if you do enough damage. That's the thing. At the end of the day, winning a game can just happen because you do so much damage that you are overwhelmingly killing the enemy team before they're able to contest the uh, objectives of the game. So as we're flanking here, that's really the consideration I'm thinking about is how do I get an angle to farm the most amount of ships, take out the targets of opportunity, the priority targets, that kind of thing. This Minotaur becomes a priority target as our Yamato absolutely crushes him. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for our poor Yamato, he left him on 380 hit points. I did not want to yoink this kill from him. It's well deserved by the Yamato, but I was worried the Minotaur would get away. So uh, it is very important we kill him, as I'm sure with a super heal there, he'd be back to 20,000 HP in no time. So we take him out, and now we're flanking. We're hard flanking the enemy team. There's really not much here to stop us. The kid, the American tier eight destroyer, that was here at the beginning of the match, well, he's been spotted on the other flank. So we really don't have to worry about him as well. So really I'm charging in here to get a broadside on this Massachusetts. The sap, well, having that 36 millimeters of pen is absolutely disgusting into these American high tier battleships. Since especially the tier eight ones have 32 millimeters of upper belt armor. And yeah, the damage that just pours in. It's ridiculous how much damage this ship does if it catches some broadsides. And that's the thing, the HE isn't even bad as we looked at. The HE is very, very strong. Um, something I really didn't mention in the review is that I do think this ship is too strong. I think that even if they'd given it normal armor piercing and you had to rely more on the HE to deal damage to battleships and angle targets, that kind of thing, I still think this would have been an amazing ship because it is just that good. Um, but they've given it sap, so I may as well use it and take advantage of it. So unfortunately, not able to hold the angle on the Massachusetts, but we do force him to go out into our team, right? He's forced into a bit of an awkward position. And we finally find what I've been looking for on this flank. It's always so satisfying when you're able to catch the carrier. This is one of the best feelings ever because carriers tend to play at the very back of the map, as you can see, and never be spotted and never be contested. So. Finally catching one always feels amazing. And the sap, oh, the sap. It does so much damage into this carrier. And I think that's primarily down to the tier eight carrier not having uh, the armored flight deck that some of the other tier tens would have. I wish the tier tens actually didn't have an armored flight deck because as you can see, if the carrier gets caught, it dies very quickly. The tier tens aren't necessarily like that. With that armored flight deck, they're very tanky actually sometimes tankier than battleships, harder to take out because they have an armored flight deck that you're just gonna shatter off of or bounce off of. Whereas a battleship has a giant superstructure up there that's the easiest thing in the world to farm. So as we take out this uh, aircraft carrier, we're up to 132,000 damage. And this game is quickly slipping away as I have completely ignored the objective and the enemy team has certainly taken over. Um, unfortunately, we are gonna take Pretty good hit bow into this Yoshino. That ship, of course, has some very, very dangerous guns. The HE does an absolute ton of damage. So I'm gonna try and farm him a little bit as we try and get away from here. I do use my smoke. With this build, of course, I'm very greedy for guns. So I only have two smokes. I don't have three. So this is the last one used up. And I use my defensive fire quick to try and help our Yamatos stay alive and not take a big hit from the last strike from the carrier. But no smokes left could be a problem going forward. <laughs> it's going to be difficult for a Sherman with only one concealment upgrade to contest the middle cap against a daring special. But even the full health kid could be a very big problem for me since I don't have a lot of HP left. I'm going to pop my Hydro though 
as I am concerned about Yoshino Torps. I don't want to eat a uh, torpedo that otherwise could have been avoided if I had just had my Hydro up. I think with how many Hydros there are that this ship has, it's very easy to use them pretty frequently. I don't think saving them is necessarily going to be the best thing in the world. And there we can see we actually spot a couple of torpedoes that are, well, meant for the Yamato. It's probably most likely the torps are going for Yamato, but you never know. So it's better to be safe than sorry. And again, into the Proisen, well, we're going to try and light a fire and then swap over to the Sav. Since the Proisen has so much HP, having even a single fire burning is a really, really good thing. The more HP a enemy ship has, the more damage they're going to take from a fire, since it's percentage based. So as these super ships come into the game, as these massive battleships come in with over 100k HP, well, it just buffs the ability of fires to take them out. <laughs> that's really that's really one way to look at the inflated HPs that some of these battleships are getting. And, uh, well, we're getting a little unlucky on our fire chance, I gotta say. <laughs> that took us, what, 75 hits to get one fire? Yeah, it's all about RNG, right? Even though this ship has an insane fires per minute and 9% fire chance base, well, if RNG says no, RNG says no. So after getting that first fire, I swap over to the sap, of course, because we're wanting that little bit of extra alpha damage. A broadside battleship, it's very easy to get those full pens into his superstructure. And we notice he's not on fire as he comes around the corner. So back to the HE it is. This is the damage farming greed strategies, right? We're still getting pretty good damage out of the uh, high explosive, but you'll notice it's not quite as much. It's 297, 594 instead of those juicy, juicy, like 400, 800, 1200, depending on the number of shells that hit at once. So the sap certainly does more damage, but getting those fires is very, very valuable. And of course, we light the price up right away again. Uh, that is pretty classic for a battleship player. <laughs> I've been there where you damage con the fire and then pretty much instantly another one is lit up on you. So as uh, well, the Alsace takes the kill and we're up to 205,000 damage, which I believe was my previous record, was somewhere in the 205, 210,000 range. As I said in my review, it's really consistent damage output ship. I haven't really had the outlier games, at least up to now, where I do more than really 200,000. I think that that, for a tier 10 ship, in that, at least for myself, 100 to 200,000 damage is a pretty normal experience for me. Not every game is gonna be happen like that, but I don't consider just 200k as this overwhelming, unbelievable game, unless it's like that Moskva one where uh, we had to do a lot of work getting a crack and all that stuff. Uh, so this one, unfortunately, I take another huge hit from our, uh, from high explosive. I've done a really poor job of managing my HP pool in this game, haven't I? I turn to not dodge the Monarch Salvo, I turn to make it easier for the Monarch to hit me. Yeah, so not the best uh, example of managing HP in the Sherman, and I really would love to have that HP back. So now I have to run, right? The enemy team has taken out both battleships that were rolling with me on this flank, and I'm left alone on low HP. So after taking the middle zone cap, I run away. And now we're going to try and use this island here to our left to limit the number of people who can shoot at us while trying to take out this monarch with our team. So even though we're on low HP and a few shells could really kill us quite quickly, I'm still going to risk it and try and take this Monarch out. We really need to at this point, 915 on the uh, enemy's point total. Keep in mind also two minutes left on the clock. So it's a situation where we basically have to kill the entire enemy team and I don't have the HP to do it. That's the issue here. I've probably taken... 10,000 HP worth of damage that I didn't have to in this game. Uh, I played too aggressively, not dodging particularly well. If I'd been paying more attention to managing my HP pool, I think I could have easily been on 10k HP, probably even 14, 15k HP, and that might have been the difference maker. Something I do want to point out though, is that the Daring did get spotted just as I was going around this corner to start farming the Monarch. And this is why I have decided to run away so aggressively. Instead of trying to walk my way around this island, constantly trying to just stay close to the island and shoot at the Monarch as he's going around. I don't want to get into a close range engagement with a full health daring or near enough full health daring. I know I'm going to lose that. So as this Charles Martel comes around the corner, 
Well, of course, it's going to be Sap again as we took out the Monarchs. That's three kills, actually. And we're up to 233,000 damage. And here comes the problem. We get our Confederate, but we don't have enough HP to use it. And there's a Daring in our face. <laughs> this was what I was worried about. So trying to dodge is, again, difficult. Like we talked about in the review, this ship is very sluggish. It's slow. It's easy to hit, especially at close range. And this Daring is not quite going to take us out. 1,000 HP left over and 38 seconds left on the clock. Unfortunately, that is how this game is going to end. I don't have the HP to win it. And if I had done a better job of managing my HP or playing the cap, I think I could have won this game. But I played selfish, I went for the damage, and to be fair, I did get a good damage result. 250k is really, really solid in my opinion. But I think I could have won the game had I played more for my team. So two games that uh, are both very good, but I do think the play style of the Moskva and uh, playing for your teammates, trying to help them succeed as well, is going to result in a few more wins. I don't think there's really anything wrong with either playstyle. Going for damage certainly is a pretty good time, but uh, for me personally, I can't really complain about losing a match where I go exclusively for damage and ignore the cap zones. And uh, that's why I really wanted to show both, because there are really, really good games to be had with both playstyles. I think the damage-focused one is certainly going to be more consistent for having high damage numbers. But uh, if you play for your team, you can still have pretty high damage output while also getting a few more wins. So several different ways to play the game, but uh, these two definitely worked for me in different ways. And I think both of them were very good games to learn from. Uh, but that's going to be it for today. I uh, have both the Sherman and the uh, Mosfuck builds here for you guys. And uh, really, they're basically my pretty standard builds. I haven't really changed them recently at all. So thank you very much for watching. I hope uh, you uh, enjoyed this video. It was entertaining, or maybe even you learned something a little bit. But uh, that's going to be it for me for today. Um, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.